Good evening and welcome to the Leonard Theatre at Fordham Prep. My name is Patrick Hornbeck and I have the great privilege of being chair of the theology department here at Fordham University. I want to offer a special welcome to those who are not physically here but who are joining us virtually this evening. So first of all, at Fordham College at Lincoln Center, two groups of people in McNally Amphitheater and the 12th Floor Lounge. Folks who are joining us on this campus from Keating First Auditorium. Hundreds of people who are dialing in from around the metro area and indeed around the country to pay attention to and participate in this wonderful dialogue this evening. And I want to say a few minutes, a few more things about ways that you all can participate in this conversation. But let me ask this question, why are we here? Well, this is the first in what we hope will be an annual series of events that will bring together the whole first year class of Fordham College at Lincoln Center, Fordham College at Rose Hill, the Gabelli School of Business, and the School of Professional and Continuing Studies. We are calling this the Fordham Theology 1000 First Year Experience Lecture. And the goal is to provide a point of common ground for students in every section of our signature course, Faith and Critical Reason. And we want to make sure that every year we engage a topic of contemporary importance that reflects and reflects on the subject matter of what you all are learning in your theology classes. Thinking about the topic for this year's event, your professors in the theology department were particularly mindful of two things. Fordham's overall mission as a Jesuit university and our department's mission as a theology department committed to what the Jesuits have been calling and have been standing behind as the service of faith and the promotion of justice. And today, if we think about the promotion of justice in the United States, in the Bronx, in Manhattan, in all of the places that our students and faculty come from, well, thinking about justice means thinking at least in part about racism and racial justice. It's hard to imagine reading the news today and not coming across multiple stories that implicate the ongoing harm of the legacy of racial injustice in this country. But a second question, why talk about this in the context of a theology course? Well, our distinguished Fordham faculty colleague, uh, Reverend Dr. Brian Massingale, who will be participating in this evening's dialogue, he has called racism a soul sickness. So also did the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we gather here today, 50 years after Dr. King's assassination, 55 years after he wrote his famous letter from a Birmingham city jail. But the unjust social structures that Dr. King was reacting to still persist. And so also do the questions that he raised about the role of the church and of religious institutions more broadly in resisting the kind of inertia that allows those structures to perpetuate themselves. So tonight, our commitment is that what Dr. King espoused throughout his whole career of justice and nonviolent resistance, that also remains as relevant as ever. So we're gonna be exploring the relevance of Dr. King's challenge to church and society and explore the role of theological discourses and spiritual practices in confronting racial injustice and violence. Now, before I introduce our special guest, I want to offer grateful thanks to some of those who've made tonight's conversation possible. And first among them is Fordham's creative, groundbreaking, and innovative Chief Diversity Officer, Rafael Zapata, who's joining us this evening. <laughs> We're grateful to Fordham Prep for allowing us to have this event in Leonard Theater. We're grateful to the Arts and Sciences deans for their support. We are so privileged to have among us the provost, vice presidents, deans, members of the board of trustees, faculty members, and most importantly, you, our students. So thank you all so very, very much for being here. We're delighted to welcome to Fordham a distinguished guest, Michelle Alexander. 
She is a highly acclaimed civil rights lawyer, social justice advocate, legal scholar, and visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary here in New York. She's now a columnist for the New York Times, having published her first column just last month. She's renowned for delivering insights that pave the way for new perspectives on our criminal justice system, on the practice of mass incarceration, and the various challenges facing the civil rights community. And she's the author of the best-selling book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. Among her many academic and legal distinctions, she served for years as director of the Racial Justice Project at the ACLU of Northern California. She directed the Civil Rights Clinic at Stanford Law School, and she was a law clerk for US Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman. Please join me in welcoming Michelle Alexander to Fordham. So one last word from me, because you're not here for more of this. Um, <laughs> we've invited Professor Massengale and Ms. Alexander to spend about 40 minutes, 45 minutes or so, talking with each other at first. And as you listen to this part of the conversation, we invite you to write down on the index cards you were given as you came in this evening. This applies as well at Lincoln Center and at Keating First. Write down your cards. Write down questions you have, comments you have. Um, we will collect all of them electronically, we'll put them on an iPad, and we'll give them to our speakers about halfway through this evening. So we welcome your participation, even though we may not have time for all of the questions. So please, Professor Massengale, Ms. Alexander. Okay. This is wonderful. Michelle, thank you for being here. Welcome to Fordham. And just on my own behalf, it's a thrill to participate in this conversation with you. As I was sharing with you backstage, your work has been just so um, important and groundbreaking and informative for me. So thank you for your activism. Thank you for your mm -hmm. spirit. Thank you for your leadership. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, um, for having me. I was honored to be invited and also grateful for the opportunity to read uh, King's letter from the Birmingham jail again. It had been many years since I had read it, and reading it now at this moment in time was powerful uh, and disturbing in many ways how mm. relevant it remains uh, at this moment in history as well. So, Yeah, we were talking about that backstage, how it's both timeless, but yet timely. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about what made reading the letter so powerful and disturbing for you this time around? I think, you know, the very first time I read it, I was struck by him speaking directly to white moderates. Mm -hmm and calling them out for preferring order to justice mm -hmm. and for kind of pursuing the path of least resistance, mm -hmm. even as so many millions of people were suffering and were being oppressed and mistreated, that they were comfortable waiting Yes. and telling others to wait, uh, even though you know, so many folks, so many young people uh, were being raised in an oppressive state. And this time around, kind of reading it again, one of the things that most struck me wasn't so much what he had to say to white people, but really how he was describing the role of the movement in those times and the necessity for creating environments of tension in which a stark choice must be made. And there's one passage in the letter where he talks about kind of the four elements of nonviolent action. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, the first stage is basically clarifying the situation, gathering the evidence, the, the facts, so that you're clear about what the circumstances actually are uh, on the ground. And then the second stage, he said, is negotiation. Yeah. 
um, going to the table with those who have the power to make a difference and stating your cause. And then he said the third stage is self-purification. And then the fourth is nonviolent direct action. And I thought about this moment we're in and all of the action and reaction that is happening in our streets, online, in our Twitter feed, and how in so many ways we've leapt from the space of defining the problem mm -hmm. to reacting um, and being in a state of anger, angry reactivity. And we have skipped over um, to some extent the negotiation piece, but more importantly, from my perspective, we've skipped over that space of self-purification mm -hmm. and nonviolent revolutionary direct action. You know, I have found often that when I talk to people about nonviolence, particularly young people in these times, they say, well, you know, we've tried that for 40 years and look where we are. I'm like, we've tried what for 40 years? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly have not tried the kind of nonviolent, revolutionary, direct action that King was about for 40 years. No, we've been engaged in something altogether different, um, kind can, of can, politics as usual. Can I ask you about that? Because I do think that when I teach that King's philosophy, many people have this idea that King's whole movement was simply a movement of physical integration. Let's mm -hmm. get black people to ride on the bus with white people. Let's mm -hmm. get black people to go to the same schools as white people. Let's we can drink from the same drinking fountain. But you're trying. You're suggesting that King's activism was directed to something that was far, far more far-reaching. Can you talk about what you see as King's vision? I think, vision? Well, certainly by the end of his life. And, yeah. you know, King wasn't a static figure. Mm -hmm. um, he grew and he evolved and he changed in, over the years. And I think that he grew and evolved in ways that were very healthy as a result of the Black Power Movement, as yes. a result of Stokely Carmichael and Malcolm X challenging him um, directly and saying, you know, how is this message of nonviolence to be heard in ghetto communities? Mm -hmm. How is this message of nonviolence to be heard in places where um, there is hopelessness and people who have tried and struggled have been repeatedly met, not only with violence, but kind of shifting rules and redlining and all of the rest? Mm -hmm. What do you have to say to them? And the challenge that kind of King faced um, from kind of many within the black freedom struggle, um, I think helped him to grow and to clarify his own vision and expand his own imagination about yes. the way forward. And so who King was in 1968 was not exactly the same person who he was in 1963 or in 1965. And yet we typically want to freeze King um, exactly. with the I have a dream speech. And we're unwilling to see, you know, the message that he delivered in 1968 in, you know, the Beyond Vietnam speech at Riverside Church, where mm -hmm. he said it was time for us to get on the right side of the global revolutions that were occurring around the world. Mm -hmm. And it was necessary to see that, you know, materialism and militarism and racism mm -hmm. were triplets that were likely to doom our democracy if... We did not have a revolution of values, and this revolution wasn't a rhetorical revolution. He was calling on us um, to imagine the necessity of you know, a radical restructuring of our economy and our political system, um, but that it, a revolution of that nature would have little meaning um, if we weren't actually opening our hearts um, to one another, not only those who live in our own communities or on our side of the tracks, but open our hearts and our minds to those who are on the other side of the globe. Mm -hmm. um, King was talking about a global revolution of values that would have implications not just for 
integration, right. um, but for foreign policy and how our economy is structured and the way we live with one another. Exactly. And so this far-reaching revolution that King is advocating for, this revolution of values, as, you, as, as he called it, it's been really pivotal to the turn you've made in your work. You began with mass incarceration, you began your career as a lawyer and doing civil rights activism, and yet lately in your work you've talked a lot about how we need to develop the spiritual challenges and the spirit, we need to explore the spiritual challenges that mass incarceration puts forward. And you've quoted King's phrase of this revolution of values is being the unfinished business, but yet we can't even deal with mass incarceration without this spirit, without this kind of moral and spiritual revolution. So can you first do two things? One, tell us how you got involved with this concern for mass incarceration. And then second, why would you give up being a lawyer? Because I think a lot of people out here think, well, don't you want to be lawyers? Uh, why would you want to give up being a lawyer to pursue the moral and spiritual dimensions of attacking mass incarceration. So first, how did you get involved in this, and then what led to your turn? <sighs> well, you know, <clears throat> I decided I want to go to law school in part because I had been raised with a very romantic idea of the civil rights movement, and I imagined that I had a role to play in kind of the unfinished business of that movement. I subscribed to this idea that, you know, our nation was on the right path, but we still had a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And I was inspired um, by King and Thurgood Marshall and, um, you know, many of the warriors um, for civil rights and thought that it was my job to kind of finish the job that had begun mm -hmm. um, decades ago. And, I started off representing victims um, of race discrimination, sexual harassment, gender discrimination, working for a plaintiff side, a civil rights firm suing companies like Home Depot and public supermarkets, um, representing people who weren't being hired or weren't being promoted because of racial stereotyping and um, harassment they experienced on the job. But it wasn't until I went to the ACLU and began directing the racial justice project there and started representing victims of racial profiling and police brutality and investigating patterns of drug law enforcement that I had a series of experiences that really opened my eyes mm -hmm. and led me to realize that this narrative um, that I had bought into and that I felt in many ways, you know, so many of us who claim to care about racial and social justice had bought into that those who seem to be trapped at the bottom, the members of the so-called underclass uh, who were on welfare, cycling in and out of jails, that they were there because of broken homes, bad schools, poverty, the ways in which the American dream hadn't quite yet reached them. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't quite see, until I had been representing folks and investigating this, that actually a new caste-like system had been born again in America. Yes. That it wasn't just that there were bad schools or broken homes or poverty, but a literal war had been declared on these communities. And as a result, a wave of punitiveness had washed over them and we had embraced a new system of racial and social control, such that once you were arrested and branded a criminal or felon, you could be stripped of you know, all of the rights supposedly won in the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. like the right to vote, the right to serve on juries, the right to be free of legal discrimination and employment, housing, access to education, and basic public benefits, and that this system of mass incarceration, this quintupling of our prison system that had happened in just a few short decades couldn't be explained simply by crime or crime rates or patterns of drug use or sales, that it was the result of the backlash against the civil rights movement. Um, it was a result of fear mongering on the part of politicians who sought politically profitable to cast you know, black men in inner cities as the enemy um, 
at a time when you know, there was economic collapse and a real depression mm. occurring in inner city communities and rising crime rates. And so I became obsessed with trying to kind of wake people up mm -hmm. to see what our nation had done again, that we had managed to birth a new caste-like system in America and that it had happened on our watch, even as people who claim to care about racial and social justice, for the most part, stood idly by. Yeah. But can we talk about that just for a moment? I know I asked you two questions. I'll come back to the other one later. But this is really cool uh, and critical. You said that, we, that this new racial caste system has been created. But I'm sure for some people, when they hear that, they'll look at it and say, how can you say there's a racial caste system when they look at both of us, we're both very professional. They'll say, look at Oprah, she's, you know, you know people say that, don't they? Um, they could say, we've had this black president. So in what way or how do you see a racial caste system or a system of racial control when people will look to us and say, well, the two of us, we've made it. So how do you respond to that? Yeah, well, you know, in this age of so-called color blindness, mm -hmm. not all people of color are trapped within this caste system. But the drug war was born with black folks in mind. The enemy um, had a color. And you know, I know there's many people here who may not have been born even, or certainly were too young to remember a moment in our history when our television sets were just awash with images of black men in handcuffs and raids on public housing, and when our nation was at a fever pitch and a literal war was declared in poor communities of color, and uh, the politicians talked endlessly about crack babies and crack dealers, and it was understood that drug use and drug addiction and drug sales and drug dealing was a black problem. Yes. And that these people had to be dealt with harshly and to be taught a lesson. Um, and both political parties uh, fell prey to this, even though throughout the drug war, um, the research was consistent showing that you know, people of all races used and sold drugs that nearly identical rates, but the enemy was defined as black and brown. And because the enemy was defined as black and brown, um, this just wave of punitiveness washed over. And politicians um, you know, found it easy to say, let's get tough on them. And one of the reasons it was easy for politicians to do so is because there was heightened white anxiety at that time about changing demographics. And the shifting demographics at that time had to do with the fact that this whole group of people who had been once locked into an inferior caste system were suddenly freed legally from that caste system and in a position to compete on equal terms for scarce jobs and to compete for education and Ivy League schools. And this demographic mm -hmm. shift where suddenly a whole new group of people were competing for jobs and opportunity um, with a group of people who had been taught their whole lives to believe those folks are inferior to you, mm -hmm. created an enormous amount of fear and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And politicians who were former segregationists found that instead of saying, you know, whites only or segregation forever, they could instead say law and order. Let's get tough on them. Mm -hmm. And in a racially coded, officially colorblind fashion, channel fear, resentment, racial anxiety um, towards them. Um, because they're defined as the criminal. Yes, which made it easy for people to say, yeah, let's get rid of them. Lock them up and throw away the key. Um, and the extreme racial bias in drug law enforcement made it possible for us to wage a literal war with SWAT teams, knocking down doors, grenades being thrown into apartments. You know, people often think that when we talk about the drug war, it's sort of political rhetoric. But the drug war has been a literal war waged with military equipment. Um, the Pentagon 
transferred enormous amounts of military equipment to local law enforcement agencies, and a literal war was waged on those communities. And because it was waged only on those communities, it was possible then um, for you know, mainstream middle class whites to say they support the drug war even though their kids were using and abusing drugs and instead of getting prison time were heading off to college or eventually getting their act together mm -hmm. and holding down jobs and going to work. And this war led to the birth of a caste-like system because the punitiveness gave way in the Clinton administration to uh, you know, uh, laws that barred people who had drug felonies from getting federal financial aid for schooling, um, laws that barred people with drug offenses from you know, being able to even get access to public housing, barred people with drug offenses from getting access even to food stamps, food to survive. Um, so that once you were la labeled a felon or a criminal, suddenly you were relegated again to this permanent second class status. And kids were then born into these families, born into families where their parents were legally barred from voting, where they were barred from public housing, where food stamps might not be available to them, where they could be legally discriminated against in employment. Um, and a, a whole other generation um, of African Americans were raised in an environment that functioned much more like a caste system mm -hmm. um, than anything else. I want to draw the parallel or the, how the caste system, it doesn't just simply affect poor African Americans or poor Latinos. It also can affect people who are seemingly have made it. For example, the, um, the recent phenomenon of um, whites calling the police yes. on African Americans yes who are just engaged in everyday activities such as babysitting, barbecuing, yes. um, you know, shopping. Yes. Because of the understanding or the association of black and brown with criminal. Yes. And so how that caste system doesn't simply affect those who are directly incarcerated, who are now stripped of voting rights and food and access to public housing, but because of the association of black and brown with criminal, yes. it becomes a caste system that affects even those who are not immediately incarcerated, even those African Americans, Latinos, who are not felons per se. Can you talk more about that, or does that make any sense to you? That's, uh, yes, it makes all the sense in the world. I mean, I think all of us have you know, seen these instances now. I mean, for a period of time, um, we, as a nation, were forced to reckon with the reality that police kill unarmed people, especially unarmed black men, kind of with impunity. And video uh, footage you know, forced us to reckon with that reality. Um, and these videos went viral through social media. And now we are seeing all of these videos of people calling the police on folks while they're napping in, you know, the lobby of their dorm or, or, or you know, trying sitting, to sitting in Starbucks, si sitting in Starbucks or trying to have a picnic by the lake or, mm -hmm. you know, this temptation to just pick up the phone and, you know, call the police, dial 911 because there's a black person here um, going about their life in a way that might make me feel a tad uncomfortable. And uh, you're absolutely right. You know, in this age of mass incarceration and mass criminalization, um, where there's been a conflation of blackness and criminality, um, it then becomes rational and reasonable in the minds mm. of you know, many whites to think of any black person who seems out of place or that makes them uncomfortable as a potential threat mm -hmm. or someone who should be dealt with harshly through law enforcement. Right. You talk a lot in your work about the influence of history. And I'm bringing that up because I'm sure for some people listening to this conversation, they may feel uncomfortable saying, is she blaming all white people for thinking all black people are criminals? So can you talk a bit about what's going on with individual persons 
and versus what's going on in terms of the structure of racial control. Because I'm sure that there are many individual whites who are saying, well, I don't feel that way. So how does, that, how does the person versus the structure of racial control or the influence of our, historic, of our history in terms of how people can be working off these things unconsciously, perhaps? Well, you know, let's, let's go way back because okay. I think that in order to have a conversation about our racial present, we have to take into account kind of how we got here. And we wouldn't have a system of mass incarceration and we wouldn't have a system of old Jim Crow um, if it hadn't been for the institution of slavery. And the institution of slavery is what defined blackness and whiteness in America. And not all white people wanted slavery right. when it was born. But once the institution of slavery was born in the United States and inscribed into our Constitution, it set up a system of relations between you know, groups of people defined by race. And white people were taught from the time they were babes, mm -hmm. <laughs> that they were superior, inherently mm. superior, and had an inherent right, and often were taught a God-given right um, to treat those with dark skin as inferior and as their captives and as unworthy. Mm -hmm. And once the system of slavery faded away, those white people, many of whom were kind to their neighbors, who were good parents to their children in many respects who were not bad people of their time, but nonetheless held a system, a belief system that was evil in many respects. Yes. Those people were faced with a choice at the end of the Civil War. Are we going to you know, view ourselves as friends, neighbors, um, community members, of common cause, or are we going to continue the relationship of racial hierarchy that has been established as a result of slavery? Now, as you can, any of us, I hope, can understand that with the dissolution of slavery, that all of the attitudes, all of the belief systems, all the habits of being and relating didn't vanish overnight with slavery. Um, and in fact, many whites felt threatened by black folks suddenly competing with them for jobs and scarce resources. And many white people feared being thought of as black because mm -hmm. anyone could see what it meant to be black in our yes. society is a yes. scary thing. And so here we are, right, centuries later, and we still have these politics in which white people you know, have perhaps even an unconscious desire to cling to their privilege, to cling to a feeling of superiority, and fear and resent uh, any implication that they owe anything to black people or that they should have to give anything up as a result of what has occurred um, to African Americans throughout history. And at every moment in which poor and working class whites and blacks have attempted to join forces around their common economic interests. Um, elites have attempted to destroy those alliances by persuading you know, poor and working class whites to choose their racial status interests over their economic kind of shared interests um, with African Americans. And that happened you know, during kind of the populist era at a time when you know, poor and working class whites and blacks, the descendants of slaves gathered to, came together to try to build a, a movement to challenge the railroads and to challenge the plantation elite. Um, and that was decimated um, by you know, efforts to you know, persuade whites that no, your black allies are really inferior to you and we will give you some economic benefits if you go along with this program of white supremacy. And when black folks were disenfranchised, you know, their former white allies largely abandoned them. And this pattern um, and this history and cycle has played itself over and over again, which is why I think King said, ultimately what we need is a revolution of values. Mm 
And what do you think he meant by that? Or, or what, would you, what, would, what do you mean by that when you call us to reclaim King's vision of a revolution of values? What kind of revolution, what kind of values, what kind of new values do we need? Well, as I see it, in the end, we have got to be willing to embrace uh, an awareness that every single person, no matter who you are, where you've come from, or what you've done, has dignity and value and is worthy of basic human rights. Mm. And when you read the letter from the Birmingham jail, he makes repeated reference to human rights, even more so than civil rights. Mm -hmm. And this awareness that each and every one of us has dignity and value no matter who we are, where we came from, what we have done, um, I think has to be central because if we fail to develop kind of a new moral consensus rooted in the dignity and value of each and every one of us, even if we dismantle mass incarceration, even if we manage to you know, have some form of political revolution, if we haven't learned to care for one another, truly care for one another across lines of race, class, religion, ethnicity, sexual orientation, every form of gender difference, if we haven't actually learned to care for one another across all those lines of difference, even after the revolution, even after whatever form of you know, racial or social control has you know, faded away, a new one will be born. Yes. Because we have not yet learned to truly care for one another. Um, one of the most interesting pieces of research that I've come across you know, in the last several years has been research that was conducted by the Sentencing Project, which shows that the most punitive nations in the world are the most diverse. Hmm. The most kind of compassionate, the nations that have the most lenient sentencing practices and are the most compassionate are the most homogeneous. And the same goes, it's been shown in research, with public welfare programs. Um, that the most nations with the most generous kind of public welfare programs, universal health care, you know, free college education, that have the most generous public welfare programs are the most homogeneous. And so we, we tend to think of diversity as our strength, but in many ways it's our Achilles heel because there does seem to be kind of a basic kind of human, maybe lower self animal, self instinct to fear the other, to be more punitive to the other. And so really the challenge of American democracy, in my view, is, is a spiritual challenge. Is it, is it possible for us? As Vincent Harding posed the question, yes. is America possible? Is it possible for us as a nation to overcome this kind of habitual, seemingly instinctive impulse to fear, to be suspicious of, and more punitive towards the other? be less generous mm -hmm. towards the other. Is it possible for us to overcome that and actually care for the other as we would care for ourselves and our own children? And to me, that's a spiritual question, not just you know, in terms of Christianity, but every faith tradition teaches, You're do unto to others right as, here, you okay. would, um, as you would do <laughs> unto yourselves, right, right? Right, You're singing to the choir, as um, Patrick was saying earlier, I usually talk about racism as a soul sickness. And that for me, I think the question of race raises the question, is this someone I should care about? Yes. And I remember going to a Black Lives Matter rally, and I saw um, two twin protesters, one a black man and one a white man. And the black man had a sign that said, is his life worth more than mine? Mm -hmm. And the white man had a sign with the arrow going the other way, is his life worth less than mine. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying is that indeed is the core spiritual moral challenge posed to us by mass incarceration, by racism, by systems of racial control. Do we have the will to care for someone who does not look like us? Yes and who may not think like us, who may not worship like us, who may not love the way we think that they should love. Are we willing to care for the other and to wish for them what we would wish for ourselves or for our own families or for our own community? 
And to me, that's the central question that's posed by mass incarceration as well as mass deportation. You know, mm -hmm. we're willing to build walls to keep those people out. Is this what you would wish for yourself if you were poor and hungry? Is this the way you would want a nation to treat you? Um, would you want your own child who was caught with some weed, you know, caught with some blow, caught with, would you want your own child to be given a jail cell, branded a felon, stripped of basic rights for the rest of their life? Is that what you would want for your child? Mm -hmm. So why is it okay for those kids? And when we're able to get to a place where we can see the other and ask ourselves, is this what I would want for myself, for my family, for my children? If the answer is no, then we have a responsibility at that point. And I think many of us avoid the question because we don't want the responsibility that that question implies. Um, the responsibility mm. of actually having to do something to change it, to tell difficult and uncomfortable truths. And so it's easier to pretend that we don't know. Um, that mm. it isn't really our problem, it isn't really our business. Yes, we know over there on the other side of the tracks, people are cycling in and out of jails and that the police are shooting first and asking questions later. We know this is happening, but we pretend that it's complicated and confusing and we don't really know and yeah. that relieves us of the responsibility of being honest and taking courageous action. At the end of your book, you quote James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. And you have this marvelous quote, which is one that's close to my heart too, where he says, this is the crime of which I accuse my, my country, country and my countrymen, that they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives, and they do not know it and do not want, want to, to know, know it. it. It is their innocence that constitutes the crime. crime. Yes. Yes. And so, would, am I hearing you correctly in saying that that's, it, you see that as kind of the spiritual state of our democracy right now, that we are living, that the true danger of our democracy is that we're living in a time where we are destroying hundreds and thousands of lives, either through mass incarceration, mass deportation, and other means, and yet we haven't summoned the will to confront these horrible social evils. Yes, I think so. And you know, I, it isn't a, a black-white problem. You know, um, I think the crisis of mass deportation has forced us to understand that you know people of all colors are being impacted by this mentality and that it's an us versus them problem. But it's also a problem within the black community, mm. you know, and I think it's something that we have to look at ourselves, which is, you know, to what extent have we bought in? Have we bought in to kind of the logic of white supremacy? To what extent have we allowed ourselves to view one another as us versus them and to respond with punitiveness rather than care, compassion, and concern? Um, to what extent have we become as much part of the problem as part of the solution? Um, over the summer, I actually went to a five-day meditation retreat mm. that was organized specifically for people of color. Um, many activists attended, um, folks of all different walks of life attended, but the theme of this meditation retreat was decolonize your mind. And the idea was to kind of take a big step back from all of the battles, the reactive battles that we are in, to take a deep, a big step back and to become aware of what we think, what our habitual thoughts are, um, our thought patterns, and to what extent um, are we free mm. in our own minds, choosing um, a path of love, choosing a path of care, compassion, and concern for others, choosing what we would genuinely want for ourselves and others, or are we in a place of reactivity in which we are captured mm. 
yes. um, by those we imagine are our adversaries. What does it mean to first free your own mind, as Bob Marley would say, <laughs> free yourself exactly. from mental slavery. None, you know, but ourselves can free our own minds. And I think um, becoming aware of our complicity in the various systems that we kind of claim to be against mm -hmm. is an important step um, in our own freedom and for defining kind of what the nature of our collective freedom might ultimately be. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, those are conversations we haven't been having. Right, and your idea that the whole thing of meditation and decolonizing our minds relates to King's third step about self-purification yes, yes. and becoming clear about our own motives. And yet, you're talking about this need to develop this ethos of care and compassion and concern. Many would say that that's precisely what religious faith should offer. Mm -hmm. And yet King, in his letter, was very critical of the church. Yes. And he even said that um, he wrote the letter actually to white clergymen. And it was an indictment of religion that mm -hmm. did not offer care, compassion, and concern. And so my question, and I'm a clergyman, you know that already. <laughs> um, but I'm going to give you free freedom to go where you need with this. Do you see King's critique of the church as relevant today? Or another way of putting it, what should the church be doing to help create that ethos of care, compassion, and concern? And what maybe the church, what isn't the church doing? I think it's as relevant today as it was when King wrote his letter. Um, you know, one of the great frustrations that I had back when I was working as a civil rights lawyer and we were engaged in grassroots organizing and coalition building around racial profiling, and we were trying to sue police departments that were engaging in incredibly abusive tactics and police sweeps and trying to get clergy of all races mm -hmm. to be willing to stand up, speak out um, against the police department, um, being willing to open their doors to people returning home from prison. Uh, these were, uh, it, and again, this was in the late 90s, early 2000s, and there was an enormous amount of reluctance and hesitancy and clergy being more interested in um, preserving their relationship with the mayor or uh, the prevailing power structure than in really can speaking truth and um, being willing to kind of align themselves with the least of these. Yes. And, uh, you know, today I, I'm a bit more hopeful. There are far more um, churches and mosques and faith organizations and coalitions that are organizing around mass incarceration and mass deportation. There's far more people today than there were 10 years ago um, who are doing really important work, not just for formerly incarcerated people, but with formerly incar incarcerated people and who are going into prisons and jails, not just to save their souls, but mm -hmm. to ensure that they um, have lives um, where they can thrive and survive on the outside. But there is still just an enormous gap, I think, um, between kind of what Christians preach in terms of forgiveness and compassion and opportunities for redemption and uh, their willingness to speak truth to power mm -hmm. in the age of mass incarceration and mass deportation. It's interesting you talked about the fact that you see more churches doing this because my experience has been when I teach the letter to Birmingham jail, it, from Birmingham jail, is that most of my students look at King's critique and say, yes, the church really is irrelevant. Yes. So I'm going to try something here. I, didn't, I don't have the script it here. Um, the students here, how many of you in your church in the last three years have heard a priest or a minister or a rabbi or your imam 
preach a homily where he used the term mass incarceration. All the Jesuits right there, fine, okay? <laughs> Put your hands down at Jesuit Scholastics. Very few. Wow. How many That's have nice. heard a homily in the last three years where your priest, your minister, your rabbi, your imam, he or she has used the term mass deportation? A little, little bit better, good. Yeah. How many have heard a, a homily that explicitly named racism as being a sin or something that's contrary to your faith? A few more, but not so many in the back. So it's very interesting that King basically in this letter said that unless the church did this, that the church was going to be dismissed as an irrelevant social club. Well, one of the things that I just noticed here is that a lot of people, I don't know if it was a majority, but a lot of people <clears throat> raised their hands saying, in my church, racism is condemned in some form. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that represents that you know, the majority of Americans today oppose racism in principle. In principle, right. You know. Um, we have the white nationalists coming out from you know, behind the curtains now. But for the most part, that is non-controversial. You're not offending anyone in church by saying you're opposed to racism or that it's a bad thing. But opposing the structural manifestations of conscious and unconscious bias and racism and the, the, the remnants um, of racism as well as their present day manifestations there's hardly any hands that go up. Um, there were more for mass deportation, and I think that raises kind of the interesting fact, which is that immigrants, for the most part, you know, with the exception of some hardcore Donald Trump supporters, view immigrants as innocents, that they are, they're, they're worthy of care and compassion because they are, they're poor and deserving um, of our care and concern, whereas criminals are, are guilty and shameful and they've done something wrong and therefore are the undeserving poor. Mm -hmm. And we have seen, you know, the kind of the deserving and undeserving poor kind of wedge throughout, you know, our, our politics over the years. And this is something that I think for people of faith in particular is important for us to challenge. I mean, Christians in particular, I find, will often acknowledge, oh, yeah, we're all sinners. Right? I mean, I actually remember, you know, uh, speaking at one point to, in, in a church where I said, you know, we're all sinners, and everyone nods their head, oh, we're all sinners. <laughs> we're all sinners. You know, amen, we're all sinners. And then I say, we're all criminals. And everyone's just silent. <laughs> like, I'm a, okay, I'm a sinner, but do you call me a criminal? Mm -hmm. And, after I, and I, after I gave that talk, a young man came up to me and he said, don't you find it interesting how we're all so eager to admit we violated God's law, but none of us want to admit we violated man's law? Mm. You know, so what is that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the reality is we're all criminals, right? Just in the same way that we're all sinners. You know, by the time you reach adulthood, you've likely broken a law. Um, you know, I drank mm, underage. I, I don't know. I used drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to bet you've sped, you know, on the freeway. You know, uh, we've all broken laws. We've all done wrong. Um, and yet this desire to imagine that the criminals are them and not us. Because criminals this, become an identity, not an action. Yes. It's, a, it's a label, yes. not something I've done. We've got some questions from, from the students and from our audience that uh, we'd like, they'd like to engage in, and so I'd like to offer some of them. Um, the, all of them are really good. We don't have time to get to all of them, so I apologize in advance. Um, how do we get college-age white students interested in issues of race and racism? Hmm. It's on the iPad, okay? 
Well, first, I think these are issues that have to be talked about in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, that, y you know, I think it's very easy to kind of say, oh, why don't white people care more? And one of the things that has been most striking to me, uh, you know, has been the number of white people who, after reading the book, say, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. You know, now I know and I can no longer not know. And um, I think we have to create spaces and opportunities for people not only to become educated and informed, but also to have an opportunity, you know, being given opportunities um, to work with, um, you know, communities of color and be of service um, in those communities. And in my experience, it's the rare case that people who have an opportunity to both learn um, about kind of the nature of racial injustice today and have an opportunity to serve and engage in action, walk away not caring or indifferent. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in universities are places where you can ensure that in every class, you know, please name a class where race doesn't matter. Um, in every class that there is an opportunity to talk about race, to talk about racial injustice, and that opportunities are then provided for people to get directly involved um, in, 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 in service and in action. Um, but I think it's difficult to blame people um, for not caring about things that they really don't know about. And some of us choose not to know. Mm -hmm. And some of us, particularly young people, have grown up in neighborhoods that are effectively bubbles in which you don't ever have to know. And no one has really ever bothered to teach you. And if all of what you know comes through the media or your social you know, media feed, it's very unlikely that you will, um, you know, been given the information and formed the kinds of relationships right. uh, with others that would make it possible for you to engage in right action. One of the things I find that's the biggest obstacle is our sense of racial isolation. Mm -hmm. Because I say isolation breeds ignorance, indifference, and fear. Mm -hmm. And right now I think for, uh, it's amazing to me that in my former institution and at this one, many of my students will tell me that Fordham is the most diverse environment they've ever lived in. <laughs> oh, you're laughing, why? Mm -hmm. that, and, I, and, I, and when they say that, I believe they're absolutely, they're speaking the truth. Now, the part of me that is, the, the part they don't see, because as a professor, I always say they can't say anything dumb. The part of me is saying, where the hell did you grow up? <laughs> but then the other part of me is saying, Wow, no wonder we've got this kind of ignorance to overcome because they live, and you said, mm -hmm. we're always talking about the ghetto, the mm -hmm. black ghettos. We never call white suburbs mm -hmm. white ghettos. Yes, yes. We, we, never, we never say that, we never talk about the white isolation, mm -hmm. which really gets in the way of creating this kind of multi-ethnic, multi-racial democracy yes. that we need to create. Yes. Okay. That relates to another question that's from the students. Um, my age right now. Do you have any advice for white allies for how to stick with the struggle for justice for the long term? In other words, because white people are not used to the idea of our own work for justice not leading to immediate results, can you, can you share any wisdom for how not to get discouraged and to stick with the fight? Mm. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, I guess it was last year I had the opportunity to interview Angela Davis. And oh, isn't she wonderful? Yes. She, she is amazing. Fantastic. She and is amazing. So I, I interviewed her about kind of her reflections on where we are in this moment as a result of all that's gone down mm -hmm. um, since the days she kind of entered into her own activism. And one of my students... Um, stood up and asked her a question, which was basically, you know, what do you think 
we should do about our white allies and should we even bother with them was the question that was posed to them because there was so much frustration in among kind of communities of color, activists of color with white allies, um, either well, a whole range of concerns. And she got up from her chair and walked to the edge of the stage and she said, I don't have white allies. I have white sisters and white brothers and mm. white friends and white lovers. I don't have white allies. Like, if you can't be a sister to me mm. in this struggle, mm -hmm. um, then we're not actually in it together. And I thought that was really powerful that we talk about allyship as though we're kind of aligned temporarily around some political issue or cause. And she was making the point that, you know, any kind of temporary political alliance will be just that. That if we're not in this struggle as sisters, as brothers, um, you know, as genuine friends and lovers, um, then this movement will inevitably unravel at the seams. And I think we are in a difficult place, um, mm. you know, when it comes to thinking about what it means to build a truly multiracial, multi-ethnic, interfaith, um, you know, movement at this at this moment in time. Um, but I'm I, I think she's right that if we can't at some point get to a place of thinking beyond allyship um, to really working together as sisters and brothers and friends and lovers. Um, who are who understand that our fate is tied up in our in one another, and where we're not trying to wrestle power control from each other, and where we wouldn't abandon one another when things got tough or difficult in the same way that we wouldn't abandon um, our mm -hmm. dearest friend, our sister, or lover. Mm -hmm. One of the things I try to tell students is that. Work for justice isn't simply a marathon. It's a relay race. Mm -hmm. Because what I hear in the student's question is, if we don't get immediate results, then why should I stay in it? And I always tell students is that, well, wait a minute. You know, Martin Luther King didn't know that you and I would be here right now. Mm -hmm. But you and I know that we would not be here if it weren't for what King did. And it's part of yeah. us now to be, to run our leg of the race and to pass the baton to these young people, but it's not, but we're not going to always see the end result. We're not going to see the end of the race. Yeah, and there's no way for us to know what the end result will be. And you know, people will often ask me, you know, well, what gives you hope or what's That's your- That's one of the questions here, yeah. yes. And, um, you know, do you have faith that basically it's all going to work out in the end? And, I, I, you know, I say the odds are overwhelmingly against us here. Let, let's be honest about that, that they always have been, right? Mm -hmm. They always have been. The, the fact that um, slavery came to an end through a civil war, that an extraordinary grassroots radical movement rose up and brought Jim Crow to its knees was a near miracle feat, mm -hmm. right? That these are extraordinary um, victories that weren't the result of some kind of natural progression of history, right? Um, are we willing to be in this work to speak the truth, to, to stand up to power, to organize our communities, to heal and support one another, even knowing the odds are against us, right? What we're trying to do, build a multiracial, multi-ethnic, interfaith, egalitarian democracy has never been done in the history of the world. Are we gonna do it within our lifetime? Maybe, maybe not. Will American empire go sideways and this whole thing come crashing down? Maybe, maybe not. 
We don't know, but the question is how do we want to show up in our own lives at this moment in time? And that is a, a deeply personal question. For me, it's a deeply spiritual question. Mm -hmm. Who do we want to be and what do we want our lives to be about in this short period of time we're here on earth? And I think when we look at many of the people we most revere now, whether it's folks like Angela Davis mm -hmm. or Martin Luther King, um, you can see that these are people who have chosen to live their life on purpose and to live in a way in which they took courageous action, not because they were certain of victory, mm -hmm. but because they were willing to stand up for the truth and they were willing to speak the truth and to organize whether or not it was likely that they were going to win within their own lifetime. And they were willing to wrestle with the question, what does winning even mean? Mm -hmm. What is it that we ultimately want? What is the world that we aim to co-create? And uh, I think that's the question for all of us. You know, Derek Bell was one of my favorite scholars when I was in law school, and he wrote a, a book called Faces at the Bottom of the Well, well with the subtitle, The, the Permanence, Permanence of, of Racism. Racism. <laughs> and, you know, his book and much of his scholarship was a, making a, a very persuasive case that racism was just part of the DNA of the United States of America. And that, you know, anyone who thinks that we're going to kind of get rid of it, um, overcome it, um, is living in kind of a fantasy world. And I have gotten to a place where I ask myself, well, if that's true, mm -hmm. what comes next? What comes next? Um, you know, no empire lasts forever. The United States of America will not be here forever. What is it that we are co-creating and birthing amongst ourselves that will outlast this, will outlive this? What new can we give birth to? And so for me, I think less about how do we fix America, how do we save America, but rather what new nation are we in the process of giving birth to? in our organizing, in our activism, and in our consciousness raising. Yeah. That... <laughs> you referenced the fact that it took a civil war to abolish slavery. We were talking backstage about the fact that we always celebrate King's nonviolent activism, but we don't realize we always call to mind the fact that there was a lot of violent resistance to the civil rights movement. And there's going to be inherent resistance to this new America that we're talking about because I'm remembering the New York Times article you wrote, we are not the resistance. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's resistance being given to this new multiracial, multi ethnic, interfaith, all-embracing, gender-loving, expressing America that we're trying to create. My question to you, and it comes from some of the questions here, what makes it worth the cost that it will take to bring that new nation to birth? There's going to be a cost. You just talked yes. about it. What makes it worth the cost and where do you find the strength to pay that price? You know, I think it's a question for all of us, is what, what makes your life worth living? You know, what, what is it that you stand for? You know, and I think it's a question that each one of us has to wrestle with. What I found in my own life mm -hmm. is that when I choose to remain silent in the face of injustice, when I take the easy way out, there's a part in me that is sick and ashamed of myself. Mm. I know when I'm out of alignment. I know when I could act with more courage. I know when turning a blind eye is going to cause some harm. And the question is, we can't, we can't 
solve every crisis. We can't respond to every injustice. But we can choose to live our life with a sense of purpose, a sense of conviction. Um, and for me, that's what makes life worth living at all. And whether or not we know what the end result is, um, whether we, no matter who wins in the midterms, no matter whether Trump is reelected or not, no matter what happens 20 years from now, 25 years from now, what we do know is that we're going to be going through some very challenging times as a nation and as a globe. Um, you know, the UN reported that, you know, if really dramatic radical change doesn't happen in terms of our politics and our reliance on fossil fuels in the next 12 years, we're going to be facing cataclysmic, um, you know, climate change within many of your lifetimes. <laughs> Folks who are young enough here in this room will be alive for that. And that will lead to waves of refugees and immigration and political. We're going to be looking at some difficult times, no matter who wins the midterms. And I think the question is, who do we want to be in these times? How are we going to show up in our families, in our communities? Um, or are we going to try to live as comfortably as possible? Yeah. in this short window of time that we are here. And um, I, I, I think, you know, perhaps the road less traveled is, in fact, the one worth following. And that when we're honest with ourselves, the people we admire most, the people that we appreciate the most, are those who have been willing to make themselves uncomfortable and uh, to act with courage and to be of service to others. That's what our faith traditions, all of our faith traditions call us to. And if we honor that, then I think we're bound to act with much more courage. Yeah. Um, to quote one of the Jewish sages, if we are only for ourselves, who are we? Yes. And I think that's a real key question of faith for all of us. A question here that I think is an important one that we need to look at is this. Um, when you are the privileged majority, equality feels like oppression. What are your thoughts on white privilege, or as some white Christian Americans refer to it, white oppression? <laughs> hmm. Hmm. You know, Because I have climate change on my brain, I'll use this example. <laughs> okay. My daughter asked me a couple years ago, she came home from school after having a lesson about climate change and said, you know, mom, why do we drive? Hmm. Why do we have a car? You know, our cars, don't you know they're like destroying the earth and the planet and why are we doing this? And well, we have to. We have to get around, and it's convenient. I start giving all of these answers to her about how difficult it would be to go about our daily lives without cars and how it's important to reduce the amount we drive and how it's important for all these changes to happen. But some of this is actually just too difficult to change and still live our normal lives. And then it occurred to me that for many white folks, we're basically asking them to give up their cars, right? For many white folks, white privilege is so much a part of the way you just go about living your life that it's the amount of change that would be required to give up white privilege is as unthinkable as asking someone overnight to say, well, live your life in a way that no longer does any harm to the environment. Pretty much every way we live our lives today is in some way doing harm to the environment. And so giving up white privilege is actually asking a lot. It's asking a lot of people to be willing to sacrifice the ease with which people have been able to move through their lives despite all of the pollution and harm that it's causing. Mm. And so I think when we, you know, 
talk about asking people to give up white privilege, we're going to have to be more concrete about our ask. Oh, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I, you know, in one of my classes, I, I posed you know, the question, well, to the folks of color in the room, when you ask a white person to give up white privilege, what, exact, what do you want them to do tomorrow that's different than the way they're living today? And I found that that was actually a difficult question for a lot of people to answer. You can, you can talk about how you want their attitudes to be different, for their outlook to be different, uh, but what is it? Is, it? is it reparations? Do you want them to move out of the neighborhood they're in? Do you want people to give up the suburban school that they're in? What, what does it mean to forfeit white privilege? And I think it's the question itself that we have to be willing to pose and to wrestle with, but it's also a question that I think for you know, many black folks, people of color, we have our own forms of privilege. What does it mean to give up male privilege? What does it mean to give up class privilege? I was hoping privilege? you wouldn't do it. My mind yes. was going there, and I was hoping that, but you know what, I think. But we do have a lot of undoing to do. We, we have a and lot. And we of have to get more concrete about what it is that we actually want to see is change from one another and what kinds of changes we're willing to make in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very easy, I use the climate change example because you know, it was a situation where my daughter was saying, what are you willing to do differently in your own life to help alleviate the harm that's being done to our environment? And when we say to, to white folks, what are you willing to do differently? I think we have to be willing to offer some concrete advice. I think reparations is an example. I think asking people um, to get more involved and to educate themselves, um, to get on the right side in a bold and courageous way of issues like mass incarceration and mass deportation, um, to be opposed to those forms of economic arrangements like, you know, the, facts that the basic fact that our school systems are supported by local property taxes, which bakes into it so many layers of you know, race class privilege, yeah. um, that, that we can ask people to get on the right side of it. But when we say things like give up white privilege without being clear about what that means, um, I think that we can force people, or not force people, but encourage people into a place of defensive reaction right. as opposed to inviting them um, to take kind of concrete steps, which they're then in a position of agreeing to take or not. And then we can have a conversation about that. Just as King said in his letter, it's important to create moments of creative tension exactly. where a clear choice mm -hmm. uh, is being offered. Um, I think that we have to actually become much more specific about what it is that we want to see change um, on the part of white folks and what kinds of changes we're willing to make ourselves in our own lives. Can I, um, this is a question I get a lot in class and the way I kind of um, turn it is to say, you can't just surrender white privilege because of the way our world is created. It's there whether you want it to be or there or not. Like for me of male privilege. I just can't tomorrow say I don't have it because this is something that society has given me whether I want it or not. Mm -hmm. I think in the interim, one of the things I think about is using my privilege to challenge privilege. Mm -hmm. So for example, I'm very much aware that as a, as a man, when I say there's a gender issue in the room, it's heard differently than if you were to say there's Absolutely. a gender issue in the yes. room. So that's an example of me using my- Using privilege rather than forfeiting it privilege. Exactly, yes. but using it to subvert privilege. And the way I challenge my students is to say that for many of my students, they're going to see more overt racism potentially than I will because when I'm in the room, everyone knows how to behave. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that won't be said, certain jokes that won't be said, all of that. Certain conversations that'll take place when I'm not in the room. So the question is, how are you going to behave and how do you use your privilege when I'm not in the room and everyone thinks it's safe because we all look, we're all white here? Yes. And that's a concrete way of using privilege to subvert privilege. Yes, and I think that there's also ways in which 
one form of using privilege can be to forfeit it. Mm. So for example, I was shortly after Ferguson um, mm. erupted, um, I was asked to moderate a, a panel for the Congressional Black Caucus. And this panel that was originally going to be a small group of people ended up being a panel that was comprised of, I don't know, 15, 16 people. You know, all of these legislators wanted to have their you know, five minutes to say their piece and to whatever. And originally, uh, an activist that had been organizing in the streets first around Trayvon and had been uh, at Ferguson and all that had been invited to be on the panel. And then as more and more people were being added to the panel, uh, he was told um, and I, to take his chair off the stage mm. because there wasn't going to be enough time for him, this youth activist who had actually been in the streets there because so many legislators yes. um, wanted to speak. And I'm moderating thinking, I cannot believe that mm -hmm. this legislator just told this person to get off. And I'm extremely uncomfortable. And before I have a chance to say the word, Michael Skolnick says, stands up and he says, I cede my time mm. to the young man on the yeah, floor. Yeah. And when he took the mic, he was invited back up onto the stage and he said, no, I'll speak from the floor. Mm. I'm not getting back up on that stage. And for me, that was a powerful example of when, it's imp when you have the power to forfeit your privilege and to cede it. And right now in the movement to end mass incarceration, we see very often that formerly incarcerated people um, aren't given opportunities for leadership, mm. that policy roundtables are held, and often people who have been directly impacted by the system and who know best aren't even invited to participate, or they're invited to come tell their stories, but they're not treated as, as people who have anything to contribute to the policy discussion or for, to imagining solutions. And, uh, one of the most encouraging things I've seen in recent years is a growing number of advocates and activists and scholars saying, I won't come to that meeting unless you have people who have been directly impacted there and not just to tell their stories, but to be in a leadership role. And that is an example of people using their privilege By seating. to create space, not only at the table, but um, to cede leadership roles right. um, to those who have been previously locked out. I see that we're almost to the end of our time, so I want to end by asking you two questions, and they're kind of related. Um, when you look at our society, in light of your passion for social transformation. Where do you think we're headed? And what would you ask of us in light of where do you think we're, we're headed? I don't know where we're headed. You know, I can't predict the future, but again, uh, I'm gonna return to something Angela Davis actually said that I found so inspiring, which she's, she said, this is an incredibly exciting time to be alive. And she was talking about the fact that we're at a moment where we can focus on, on Donald Trump and we can focus on his Twitter feed and we can focus on all that's wrong. And yet at the same time, we see these movements being born the movement for black lives, the dreamers. We saw incredibly heroic action at Standing Rock. We saw, we've seen you know, um, LGBTQ movements emerge and blossom in these times. We've, we've seen people of all races and colors you know, struggling to give birth to this new America, struggling. And whether or not we succeed or fail um, in the short term, um, there is something beautiful that is struggling to be born today.
And I think what I would hope is that for all of us is that we would take time to care for ourselves and decolonize our own minds and then act with greater courage than we thought we could muster and support one another and organize and dare to dream that another world is possible and that we can play an important role in, in birthing it. Um, if we do that, then we have a chance. Mm -hmm. I think it's only if we succumb to cynicism um, and allow ourselves to be swept away by the fear mongering um, and become overcome with hopelessness um, that, you know, we can predict mm -hmm. um, what the likely outcome is if we act with unprecedented courage and creativity in these times, then who knows um, what the future holds. I want to say on, on my personal behalf, on behalf of the audience here, it has been extraordinary to have you here. Mm -hmm. um, I am so proud to be a part of the Fordham community here. Um, I have a wonderful group of colleagues, and you are an enthusiastic choice to come and to break open this experience for us. And I couldn't be prouder of being a part of the Fordham community than I am tonight, and especially because we welcomed you here. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of all of us, I just want to add a few final words of gratitude. Professor Massengill, Ms. Alexander, thank you so much. Um, you've challenged us, if you just give me one second, you've challenged us this evening to do several really important things. You said to us, there is not a place in the curriculum at Fordham where race doesn't matter. And on behalf of the theology department, I want to make that commitment that in all of the places where we can be asking these kinds of questions, we will ask them. Um, there, there's a great Jesuit, Ignacio E. Correa, from, from the UCA in El Salvador. Um, and he said that the university should be a proyecto social, that the university should be a social project. And Michelle, you have challenged us tonight to live into that in a new way. You've challenged us to make this act of co-creation. Uh, for those of us who are used to speaking the language of faith, an act of co-creation, maybe even with God. And that is such an important mission. The odds may well be against us, but you have reminded us that there is reason for hope. And in the end, I'm reminded of that, that wonderful quote from Margaret Mead, where she said, never doubt, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And as I look out, I see a thoughtful, committed group of citizens. It is a real privilege to be here with you in the project of changing the world. Thank you so very, very much.